So um, now that we kind of have a little bit of a background in the, the basics of sensory signals, I want to talk about a couple signal specific. I'm going to deal with pain, or taste, and then vision. And we'll talk a little bit about the anatomy, a little bit about the physiology. Obviously, there are many more special senses and, and sensory uh, responses that we can talk about, but times when it's sort of just going to highlight those three. So we'll start out with pain. So this schematic that you're looking at here, you can see um, basically the whole pain pathway from the point of stimuli all the way out to the spinal cord, up into the higher brain centers and then motor neurons coming back out to help determine the response. So pain is really discomfort or any type of discomfort, and that discomfort can be induced by tissue damage or noxious injury. And that discomfort is going to cause evasive action. So the correction of discomfort or pain is basically to try to get away from the pain and then to sort of break your wounds, so to speak. Now, this pain response can come in two different forms. One is fast pain. Fast pain is going to be moderated by nociceptors. Also, you can call those nociceptors, but nociceptors. And it's fast pain because the information from the stimuli, the signal that's generated, is going to be sent up into the central nervous system very fast. So we have a very fast conduction signal. And what we're talking about here, what's, what's fast, just to kind of put this in ter terms of some distance, t the signal will move 12 to 30 meters in a second. So you can, that particular signal, if it was a, dis or a short distance runner, could complete the 100 meter dash in a few seconds. So that's pretty fast. What do you think is going to be required for that sort of speed? What kind of fly, uh, nerve fiber? Myelinated or not myelinated? Myelinated. So the fast pain signal is going to be modulated by, the, by a myelinated uh, fiber. And this, again, just hopefully review. I mean, it's the first time you're going to have heard this. The myelinated fiber, so this is our neuron. We have our myelin, our Schwann cells, and then our nodes of RAN-VA that allows those action potential signals to look like they're hopping along or jumping along. That's called saltatory, uh, saltatory conduction. So the signal can jump down the fiber, which speeds up the process. You know, in an unmyelinated fiber, each little kind of patch of membrane has to depolarize. And so we don't get these big hops as we move along. We have to, de we have to depolarize all along the way. <clears throat> so this fast pain signal is going to be the signal that is associated at the time of injury. So we're going to want this fast pain system to be the system that happens when you put your hand on that burn. Hopefully this system is healthy. 
And so as soon as your hand is placed on the burner, milliseconds go by before you're beginning to respond and move your hand away. So this is sort of that instantaneous pain. The immediate pain that you feel, that you feel is going to be conducted through this fast pain system. Then we're also going to have a slow pain. Slow pain is also going to come from nociceptors. But we're going to have a much slower signal rate. So this rate of speed, 12 to 30 meters per second for the fast pain, slow pain, we're going to have speeds of about a half to two meters per second. So to put it in terms of that uh, long distance or the short distance runner, the sprinter, you're now looking at 50 seconds to complete the 100 meter dash, which is five times slower than fastest sprinters in the world. Right? So this is pretty slow. So as you're probably guessing, this will be unmyelinated fibers that will mod modulate this particular response. So fast pain is at the time of the noxious stimuli. The slow pain is going to be the throbbing pain that you feel after injury. We don't want to, we, we really only want to activate that fast pain system once. We only want to move that hand away to one time. We don't want to keep on moving it away because that would be energetically demanding. So once you get away from the, the stimuli, then the slow system sort of comes in and takes over and says, okay, this still hurts. We're still going to let you know that there's pain. This slow pain is going to be initiated by the release of chemicals. In particular, we have a chemical that's called bradykinin. But we also are going to have tissue damage that causes ATP to be released. So we're going to have bradykinin, ATP from the ruptured cell, and then we're also going to have serotonin. So this chemical release, the bradykinin, the ATP from the ruptured cell, and the serotonin are going to continually activate neurons to generate and produce and pull a signal back up to the central nervous system so that we're aware that we just put our hand on the burner and we continue to have that pain recognition. Okay, so fast pain and slow pain. We can also uh, categorize pain based off of its location. When pain occurs in the body, so you cut your arm, that type of pain is going to be called somatic pain. So I cut my arm. It's somatic pain. I'm going to have a fast pain response right at the time as I'm cutting through my arm. Nociceptor sends the signal back up to the central nervous system using myelinated fiber, saltatory conduction, and get basically just that one initial signal out of that very small duration of signals. Then I get that continued throbbing pain saying, okay, this is injured, you need to attend to this through that slow pain response, releasing chemicals on the neurons, sending the signal continuously back up into the central nervous system. 
So that's going to be somatic pain if it's out in the body. But we can also have internal organ pain. And that internal organ pain is going to be visceral pain. This would be the type of pain that maybe you have during a myocardial infarction, heart attack. These are oftentimes chemically induced. You don't necessarily have, in the case of tissue damage from a myocardial infarction, you don't have something like a knife cutting through the skin, right? So you're not activating the nociceptors through that mechanical perturbation. Rather, it is chemicals that are being released as those cells are being broken down and they die. Frequently, this will also involve nausea. So, gallbladder pain. If you've ever had gallbladder pain, you usually throw up for that gallbladder bladder pain. So it will induce that nausea as well. Okay, so fast pain, slow pain, somatic pain, visceral pain. How do we actually deal with pain? So what we know about pain is that the pain signal or pain signals follow intricate pathways. And we've actually seen these intricate pathways already with the nervous system. You, ha you have the, uh, the tracks that run up and down the spinal cord into central nervous system. Okay, so we're going to follow these really intricate pathways along um, spinal nerve, no, uh, peripheral nerves into the spinal cord up into higher brain centers. You know you can take ibuprofen, in a lot of cases you can help to manage the pain, and in a lot of cases you can actually almost eliminate the pain, even though it may still be there, just by taking a drug. But your body also has a very natural ability to, to defend against pain as well. And that's really what I want to talk about in, the term, in terms of modulating pain. All of those drugs, ibuprofen, uh, aspirin, Advil, Tylenol, they actually are mimics of what's naturally going to happen inside of the body. You have chemicals that are naturally produced in the body that are similar to the chemicals that you can get from over-the-counter pain relievers. Okay, so the body's defense against pain. We are going to have several what we're going to call naturally you guys are probably going to really enjoy this we have several naturally produced analgesics okay so we have chemicals that are naturally produced that help to modulate this pain response anyone know what opium is because you actually have a chemical naturally produced that's like opium. They're called opioid-like chemicals. We have a group of chemicals, I didn't spell that very well, let me try that over again. We have a group of chemicals called the enkephalins, a group 
group of chemicals called the endorphins, which, by the way, was what was responsible for your runner's high. Endorphins. And then we have a group of chemicals called dinorphins. So these are all chemicals naturally produced that are going to help provide maintenance of pain, sort of uh, kind of modulate that pain response, try to cover up that pain response, but also can give us a euphoric sense uh, or a euphoric type feeling. These opioid-like encaphalin, endorphin, and dynorphin chemicals are going to be excreted during stressful states. Um, so some examples of stressful states, obviously what we're talking about is pain. So when you're experiencing pain, this is going to be an example of a stressful state. This will be a time when these chemicals will be released. But we can also have these chemicals released during exercise. Hence, the ability to have the runner's high, or when we're scared, or have fear. All right, so we already know that the pain signal follows some very intricate pathways. These intricate pathways are actually going to be the targets during pain, exercise, and fear for these naturally produced analgesics. So as these naturally produced analgesics are, are, are generated, they are going to chemically block the, play, the pain projection pathways. Now, the, the pathway, it's a nervous system pathway, right? So we're talking about neurons. These are chemicals that are going to modulate those neurons, so we're going to call them neuromodulators. Now, whenever we block these pathways, and again, because they can, because we can release these analgesics not just when we're having pain, but during exercise and during fear. We can have neuromodulation aside from that pain response, which can result in a sense of euphoria or pleasure. Now, a lot of people don't really like to be scared, but a lot of people love to be scared. Right? You love that sense of fear, and after you've been scared, you kind of have this almost floating feeling. And it's because of this response right here. There's no pain, but we're modulating those pain receptors, and so you get this euphoric feeling. This ability to block the pain projection pathway when it is blocked, that physiologically is known as spinal gating. Basically, we're shutting down the pathway. And typically, spinal gating is going to occur in the horn. One of our horns, our anterior, anterior lateral or posterior horn of the spinal cord. Okay, so how does it actually work? What's the actual process here of uh, modulating pain? Okay, so here we got an example of a pain pathway. Up here in the fingertip, we have nociceptors that are associated with this somatic nerve. So this peripheral nerve comes into 
central nervous system. You can see it comes through our um, posterior root ganglion, and it comes into the uh, posterior horn. Posterior horn, in there we're going to have some inner neurons. And notice that this particular nociceptor is going to follow up through the spinal thalamic tract. So we're going up the spinal cord and we're going to end up in the thalamus. So the process here is to have those nociceptors activated. So we're going to have some sort of stimuli. It's represented there by a tack or whatever that is, a nail, something. We are going to get a receptor potential generated in the nociceptor. It's the beginning of the action potential. We're taking the mechanical perturbation of that tack sticking into the finger taking that mechanical perturbation and converting it into an electrical signal by generating that receptor protection. That signal that's generated follows that peripheral nerve and we go to the posterior horn of the spinal cord. Now, Notice that within the posterior horn of the spinal cord, we are going to go from this first order or primary afferent neuron to a secondary or second order afferent neuron. Now, I want you to be kind of thinking ahead here just a little bit. I've generated my signal. I've gone from a mechanical signal to a chemical signal, transmitted that chemical signal. I'm right here now, and I'm in a synapse. What is going to happen in that synapse? My first order nerve fiber, it's going to have a synaptic knot, right? We're going to call that the presynaptic neuron. In the posterior horn, you can see that we have our membrane, it's probably a dendrite, of our secondary afferent neuron, or our second order fiber. What normally happens in a synaptic cleft? How does the signal get transmitted from the presynaptic nerve fiber to the postsynaptic nerve fiber? What was that? Okay, exocytosis of what? Just in general. Nothing specific. The general class of molecules is going to be released. Neurotransmitter. Good. So we're going to re release a neurotransmitter. In the case of a pain signal, we typically are going to release a substance called substance P. So this is just a specific neurotransmitter. You'll remember that some of our neurotransmitters, things like acetylcholine, dopamine, serotonin, serotonin, GABA, substance P is just another example of a neurotransmitter that can be released. So substance P is released from this first order nerve fiber into the synapse. Now, as concentration of substance P builds up in the synapse, we're going to begin to bind substance P receptors on the postsynaptic membrane, which will be our second order fiber. In that second order of fiber, we are going to have movement of the signal from that chemical signal, substance P, into generation of a new action potential. 
It's going to start out as a local potential in the dendrite of the second order nerve fiber. That signal that starts as a local potential becomes an action potential, which then begins to travel along that second order fiber. That's the signal passed. Yeah, so the signal is passed onto processing regions. of the brain. So substance P release causes local potential to be produced and then up the secondary neuron into, um, in this case, the example we're showing here would be into the thalamus, which is going to be a processing region of the brain. Now primarily we're going to basically end up with that signal someplace like the hypothalamus or the cerebral cortex. Or maybe ends up in both places. Okay, so now we have changes that are going to occur here in the hypothalamus and in the cerebral cortex. Within the hypothalamus and within the cerebral cortex, that information is processed and we generate a new signal. So this is basically the third signal that we're generating. We have signal one, then signal two. Now we're going to generate a third signal. This signal from the cerebral cortex or the hypothalamus is typically passed to a region of the spinal cord, or the brain stem, I should say, called the midbrain. From the midbrain, we're going to send this signal to the medulla oblongata. So the signal now goes to the medulla oblongata. From the medulla, we're going to have a fiber that carries the signal to the posterior horn. Where we are now going to have serotonin that's released. Okay, So we come through here up to the cortex. I mean, it could be up here in the sensory cortex or in the thalamus or in the limbic system. We're sending the signal someplace in the cortex or near the hypothalamus, depending on what the signal is. Then we send it down to the midbrain, to the medulla oblongata, and then we have this nerve that comes back out. And notice that we're going to end up right at the same place where we started, back to the posterior form. Once we're back to that posterior horn, we have another synapse. That synapse is now going to begin to produce another neurotransmitter. In this case, it's not substance P, but rather it's serotonin. So we have this pain signal that comes in, substance P, up through higher brain centers. Coming down, substance P is still being released. I'm trying to modulate the pain, right? So serotonin now is being released. Serotonin is released. And this causes an initiation of an inner neuron fiber. Serotonin is released, initiates an inner neuron fiber to release encephalons, which will now fall onto that second order fiber. This is that second order fiber here. We're now going to have our second order fiber receiving a inhibitory signal. Okay, so serotonin is being released in the posterior horn. 
to initiate an inner neuron fiber to release in Kevlar. Second order fiber now is being doused is now being doused within calculants. And as that second order fiber is being is being bathed in those encaplons, we now have a signal. Being, we, we have competition for the signal. Substance P is going to send a pain signal. The encaphalon is going to inhibit the movement of that action potential up into the higher brain centers. So we're basically modulating that pain response here. Up here at the noce receptor, we're actually going to have other fibers. Send an inhibiti, inhibitory substance onto the nocive receptor itself. By inhibiting the second order neuron and inhibiting the noci receptor, we're not, this is not complete inhibition. But it's enough inhibition that that perception of pain. is reduced. 